Okay, this is concept four of unit one, and this is the scientific method. So this is probably something, or hopefully something, you have learned every year you've ever been in science class. And this is something you're probably gonna continue to learn every year in science class. So let's really learn it now so that you'll ace everything you ever have on this in the future, because this is super important. So first, let's just talk about what the heck science is. It is a method for studying the natural world, and we do that by gaining knowledge through observations and investigations. And so we gather information through these observations that we make of the world, and then based on those observations, we design investigations on our inferences that we have. So these words I'm using, let's break those down. Observation is something that's objective. It's based on five senses, and it's not an opinion. So for instance, you could observe that the ground is wet. That is based on your sense of touch. You can touch it and feel that it is wet. It's objective, it's not your opinion that it's wet, it literally is wet. Whereas an inference is subjective. It is a guess about an observation. So I could observe that the ground is wet and then I could infer that it rained or infer that someone spilled something. And then, so what scientists do is they start with making observations that leads them to infer about those observations. And then again, now they're going to design an experiment to test and see what happened. So let's practice. I think this picture is hilarious. I want you to think of what are some observations you can make about this picture and what are some inferences you can make about this picture. All right, I'm only going to give you one because I really want you to think yourself. But like an observation could be there is a baby because we can all observe that that is a baby. An inference could be that the baby is working because it's typing on the computer. That's the kind of thing that we do as scientists. All right, two other things we need to be able to distinguish between are laws and theories. These are different from our English definition of these words. So a law is a description of how things happen in nature. That keyword there is how, and I remember because they both end in W. An example is Newton's laws of motion. They describe how matter moves. That's pretty much what they do. Whereas a theory is an explanation based on evidence of why things happen. It's not just a guess. It's based on evidence that scientists have found. Again, I remember theory because they and why because they both end in why. So a law explains how, a theory explains why. An example is evolutionary theory. Um, explains why things look or populations act the way that they act. Important things to note, laws cannot become theories and vice versa. It's not like a theory is a guess and once it becomes legitimate enough, it becomes a law. That's not the case. One explains how, one explains why. Those are different things. Also, it's important to note that all theories start as hypotheses until they're substantiated by evidence. So they start as predictions, and then after repeated scientific evidence, we can then qualify them as theories. So the evolutionary theory is not just some random guess by one person. It is backed up by scientific evidence that has been found. Now, can it be entirely proven in every single situation? Not necessarily. But it is based on scientific evidence, and that's important. So, all that background to say, let's jump into the actual scientific method. This is just a technique for investigating phenomenon. So when scientists observe things and then they make inferences, they want to test them. And so this is kind of the step-by-step -step process that they will go through to do that. We can translate this physical process into a written lab report. And we're not going to do that this first unit in my class because I just kind of want to give us a couple of units of practicing some of these skills before I expect you to write it up formally in a report. But as we go through these steps of the scientific method, I will highlight the components of a lab report in yellow so that you can know what those are and how the scientific method kind of translates into a written lab report that you will be expected to do in the future. Another side note is not everyone goes through these steps in these exact six ways. Some people make the method seven steps. Some simplify it to four. But these are kind of the most generally accepted six steps of the scientific method. And we will go through these as we do investigations. So first, we're going to ask a question. Then we'll research and gather background information. 
Then we'll form a hypothesis, test the hypothesis, analyze the data we get, and then draw conclusions from it. So now we're going to talk through each one of these steps. So first, a good scientist like you and I will ask a question. So observations that we make in life should lead us to ask questions. In a lab report, so here's the yellow, we would clearly state this as a question and then use that question to define a purpose for conducting an investigation. So try it. You know, make an observation. You know, I could observe that often I see runners drinking Gatorade before they run in a race. So the question I could ask is, is the Gatorade making them run faster? In a written lab report, I would have a guiding question for my lab investigation that I would do. And my question could be, does drinking Gatorade make runners run faster? And then my purpose would just be of the lab to determine if Gatorade makes runners run faster. So you're just kind of restating the question as a statement. So that's the very first part. Then you would research and gather background information. See what other people have found. In a formal lab report, you will do a summary of this in the introduction. Now, when you're, you know, in more advanced science classes, that introduction could be several pages of summarized background information. Um, for my class, I'll usually just give you a very brief introduction myself just to kind of help us move into the lab a little bit further. But this is something that you would want to do. Also, you want to look for trustworthy sources for background information. What's an example of something that's trustworthy? What would be not trustworthy? So trustworthy source would be like your textbook or an expert in the field or um, um, scholarly article. Whereas a not trustworthy source for your introduction would be like someone's blog posts or a really, really long Facebook rant that someone has. You know, we really want to use trustworthy sources to write our introductions. Then from there, you'll write your hypothesis. So a hypothesis, do not tell me, is an educated guess. I want you to give me a more advanced answer because you are more advanced students. I want you to know that a hypothesis is a testable prediction that attempts to answer a question. Usually we're predicting a cause and effect relationship between variables. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can format a hypothesis, but I have a way that I want all my students to do it because every time you do it this way, you're gonna be writing a good hypothesis. And if you kind of make up your own format, you may not be writing a good one. So I would like you to use my method. And my method always is if IV, then DV, and if you want to get really advanced, because dot dot dot. So what that means, the IV is the independent variable. It is usually the cause in the experiment. DV is the dependent variable. It is the effect. So I would say if this cause happens, then I predict this effect because yada yada yada. So for example, in my Gatorade experiment with my question I asked, I would say if runners drink Gatorade, then they will run faster because maybe because the electrolytes or the sugar or something in the Gatorade. You can make up your reasoning why, but again, you want it to be logical reasoning, probably from information you found writing your introduction. Let's break down those variables a little more because this is one of the most often confused things I've ever experienced students have as a as in my class and I want you to understand this because you will have this all the way through college. Alright, so the independent variable. This is what I'm purposely changing and manipulating and messing with. It's what I'm testing. It would be the cause of the experiment. The dependent variable is what I'm going to measure. Think dependent is the data. What data am I collecting as a response to this cause? What's the effect that I'm measuring? All right, so for example, back to my Gatorade example, my independent variable, what would I be purposely changing or testing? Gatorade. So some runners would get Gatorade and some wouldn't. That's what I'd be manipulating. So that would be my independent variable. My dependent variable, the data I'm going to collect, would be how fast they run in the race because that is a measure of the effect of this cause. So that's what we mean by IVDB. Then again, write a hypothesis. So if runners, you know, drink Gatorade, then they will run faster. Or if runners drink Gatorade, then they will run slower. It doesn't matter necessarily what you predict. You just need to make sure you make 
a prediction. Use predictive words. Don't just say, if you drink something, then your speed will change. All right, drink what? Change how. Be specific. All right, once you have your prediction, you're ready to test your hypothesis. So this is where you're actually going to design an experiment. In a formal lab report, this is where you would list all the materials you're using in bullet form and then write out each step in your procedure in numbered form. As you're developing your experiment, you should always include the following things. So good experiments have a control group and an experimental group. The control group is the normal group used for comparison. It's kind of like my baseline. Whereas the experimental group is the group that's being tested and messed with and purposely changed. So in my running experiment, there's kind of two ways I could do this. One, I could take 100 people and 50 of them get water and 50 of them get Gatorade and I compare them. So my control group would be the group with water. That would be the normal drink. My experimental group would be the one I messed with would be the people with Gatorade. The other way you could do it is kind of have every runner run the race twice. So all 100 runners run it once with water and then once with Gatorade. So the control group would be their speed when they had water and the experimental group would be their speed once they had Gatorade. So that's how you kind of do that. The other thing that's really important though would be constants. So these are things that we're going to keep the same. They're not going to change. I want them all to be the same. You know, you don't want Ms. Joyner running a race and, you know, against like LeBron James. Okay, he's probably going to be faster than me because he's a professional athlete and I am not. So we want as many factors the same as possible. So all my runners should be wearing the same type of shoes, running the same length of race, running on the same day, getting the same breakfast beforehand, having the same training, being the same age. Those are all, the more things you can keep constant, the better your experiment. And if you can't keep a lot of things constant, the next best thing you can do is just try to have a ton of trials so that you can kind of average out your results. All right, this picture legitimately makes me laugh out loud. You'll see why it's here in a second. All right, once you've done your experiment and you've got your data, now we're going to analyze it. So first, you're going to organize your results into tables and graphs. Tables is just kind of to keep track of your numbers. Graphs are so we visually have something easy to look at and communicate our findings to other people. So you'll have your results section. And in your results, you may find quantitative data and you may find qualitative. Quantitative would be numerical data. Qualitative would just be descriptive data. So maybe for my Gatorade experiment, I would collect quantitative data in that I would record the time it takes them to run the race. But qualitatively, I may give them all a survey at the end of the race and ask them how do they feel? You know, are, are, you, are you sweating more than normal? Is your stomach feeling weird with the Gatorade? Those kinds of things. And all of that data would be useful to know. The way I remember this is quantitative has an N, like number, and qualitative has an L, like letters, like words. Because quantitative is using quantities and qualitative is using quality. So looking at this picture, how could you give me some quantitative observations? Well, you could say there is one dog in this picture. He has two eyeballs. Qualitatively, you could say, you know, there is plants. There is a blanket. This is a dog. Those kinds of things. And then, of course, you can make inferences too, like the dog is cold, the dog is in a forest, the dog is snuggly. Those kinds of things would be our inferences, so going back to inferences. But just know data can be quantitative or qualitative. In our results, there's three main types of graphs that we will be using in this class. There are more types, but in this class, we're going to be looking at these three. So you need to be able to make all of these types. One would be a line graph. This is quantitative data versus quantitative data. So you're going to have numbers on one side and numbers on the other axis. So it would be like time and height. So numbers on numbers is how I'd get those lines. Example, charting plant growth over time, something like that. A bar graph is qualitative data versus quantitative. So I'm going to have qualities down here and quantitative data on my y-axis. So sorry, I did not say that. This is your x and this is your y. So qualitative, that could be something like the number of students in their favorite classes. So down here on the X, I would put like science class, English, math, history, and then I'd have numbers, quantities here. And so that's how I would track how many like each subject. So note, 
obviously, majority of students like science best. And then a circle or a pie chart or pie graph is going to show percentages, so parts of a whole. So, example, the percent of students who got A's, B's, C's, D's, or F's on a test, we would show in the pie chart really nicely there. We're going to practice making each type of these graphs. Don't worry. One more thing about graphs. All graphs need a couple of things. First, they all need a title. All of them. And not just like my bar graph. Like they need a legitimate title that shows what you're showing. They also need X and Y axis labels. So that would be your X axis down here. You want to label plus a unit if applicable. And then here's your Y axis. Label plus a unit if applicable, if it's number data. Notice this is quantitative, quantitative, thus it's a line graph. Also, if you want an even scale, so notice I'm going up by 40 each time and it's evenly spaced. And here I'm going up by 10 each time and it's evenly spaced. And oh, also for me, make sure you always start at zero. I hate when y'all do that thing like you do in math class sometimes where you draw like a squiggly line and skip to 100 and then go up from there. That skews your data. I want you always, always, always starting on zero on both axes. And then last, if you need a key, that would be over here. So if you have multiple lines or something like that, you can include a key. But not every graph necessarily needs a key. All right, so once you have your results, then we're going to actually write an analysis. So this is actually in paragraph form in the lab report. And in that analysis, you would have kind of a brief overview of the variables. So tell me about the independent variable. Tell me the dependent variable. Um, tell me what the control group was, the experimental, and the constant. So you're just kind of giving me an overview of the lab just by listing out these basic things, not rewriting the procedures. Then you would clearly tell me what the data shows you, referring to your graphs that you made, and then infer why you think you got those results. So again, an inference. Why do you think the data came out the way it did? And then maybe most importantly, an error analysis. So this is where you describe at least three things that weren't held perfectly constant and may have messed with your results and how those could each individually be prevented in the future. So three errors and three solutions. Some people like this part in the conclusion. I tend to put it in the analysis. That's kind of preference. But for my purpose, we're going to do the error analysis in the analysis section. Now, every lab we have, I won't make you write this all out in paragraph form. A lot of times, instead of you writing an analysis section out, I just give you some questions that kind of get you processing through this information, um, like you'll see in kind of our first activity we do. But when we do formal labs, you will have to write all of these things out. And then last, you draw conclusions. So in the lab report, that's just the conclusion section. You need to include a clear statement of if the data supports your hypothesis or not. Never, ever, ever say you prove something or disprove something or you're correct or incorrect. Because this is not the end all be all. This is just one experiment testing it, this idea one time and your data may support it this time and then maybe a different time it wouldn't support your hypothesis. So we want to be really careful with the language that we use. Always tell me what you learned in the experiment and then also apply it to the real world. Like why is this information helpful to other people in their real life and not just like something we're doing in science class for the sake of doing a lab activity. Okay, whew, that was a long one, but you did it, and now we are going to practice this.